The GovX Show is supported by Forrester, helping government organisations perform at their best. Visit forrester.com to learn more. Hello again and welcome to another episode of The GovX Show. I'm Tim Coulthard, Community Director here at GovX Digital. Joining me today is Daniel Bloodworth, who is the Director of Emerging Technologies at Everbridge. We're going to be talking about an often overlooked aspect of the whole connected cities agenda, namely security and resilience. Not just in the sense of how do we throw a blanket of security over our cities and places, but how do we use that to unlock new opportunities, create feelings of well-being, and to use them as an enabler to bring businesses and leisure activities into the commercial hearts of our cities. It's a really interesting talk, conversation and Daniel's got a lot of insights to share. So without further ado, here he is. So Daniel, welcome to the GovX show. It's great to have you here today. Thank you very much, Tim. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. That's our pleasure. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about um, connectivity, about resilience, about security. You know, you recently joined us on our discussion panel at the uh, GovX digital event around connected cities and connected places. It's a hot topic, but there are lots of aspects to unpack around that. Uh, and one of which is, is this sort of resilience and safety and security piece, which I know you have particular focus on. So let's set the scene a minute before we jump into some of those interesting topics. So tell us a bit about you and your role with Everbridge and what your areas of focus are around that and how you're working with the public sector in particular. Yeah, sure. So I came into Everbridge actually as part of an acquisition in 2020. Um, so prior to that, I'd spent the best part of well, actually more than a decade uh, working in both private and public sector on um, all manner of public safety projects. And today uh, I serve as the business director of Emerging Technologies, which basically means that alongside my day job of overseeing how some of our products are being taken to market and such, I'm also responsible for working with our various product teams to determine things like future directions, partnerships, innovations, the things that we need in order to keep serving our public sector customers better um, and keeping ahead of the pace that technology is evolving at around the world. Okay, well, I like the sound of that. The fact that you've got one eye on what's coming over the horizon is interesting because I think, you know, that a lot of our public sector uh, organisations, maybe they're familiar with what's around now, but they're not sure where this is going, where this sort of connectivity piece might end up. Um, so yeah. interesting to unpick some of that stuff with you. Yeah, it's one of the actually great benefits of life here at Everbridge is that, uh, like you say, I get involved with public sector projects quite literally all over the world. And I constantly get to see new innovations, whether that's in terms of technology policy or um, just simply how they go about getting things done. Um, and it's it's been very exciting to be part of a team with such a broad spectrum of capabilities as well, so that we can address more of those different jobs that need doing to keep people safe. Mm. Um, I think a few years ago, we were we were doing well. We're, we're leading the industry with safe city capabilities. And we, a lot of people were talking about safe city, which traditionally just meant a lot of work with things like CCTV and you know, Ring of Steel in London and stuff like that. But what we are now doing, we're really being able to broaden the scope of what that term really means. So that it's um, not just for crisis management, it's also about the general day to day. Yeah. And you'll, uh, you'll hear me, you'll hear Everbridge uh, talking a lot about critical event management ra rather than exclusively crisis management, um, because that's something which is really, really important to um, to cities, to organizations, to to all all the people that we work with is being able to operate from a, a, a platform and a framework where a critical event can be quite literally anything. It, it's anything that might impact something that you care about. It doesn't have to be a crisis. And actually, most of the time, it's about getting to the problem before it actually becomes a crisis. So if you're able to get those signals earlier, whether that's, you know, risks or threats to your city from external sources if it's something that gets picked up on a camera somewhere or a sensor somewhere in the city or i don't know something that's reported by a member of the public the earlier that you can get to that signal and identify it as something that you really should care about the quicker you can take the appropriate action to minimize the potential impact and 
yeah, lo lots of interesting applications that we've been working on over the uh, over the last few years. That's that's really good. It's really helpful to make that distinction because I think you're, yeah, if, if you sort of cast your mind back to, I don't say sort of the mid noughties in London, for example, where obviously the sort of security terrorism thing was was front of mind, but cities are being reimagined you know 15 years is a long time in terms of how we think about places how we think about connectivity how we think about you know laying technology over the places we live and work and and then you've got you've got the past year as well which has forced another rethink about well, what are towns and cities for are we all going to rush back to our desks are we going to have commercial real estate in the city center or is it going to be some a new, you know, new mix of commercial residential leisure you know, we, we don't quite know that so i suppose how how your technology piece fits into that it must be constantly evolving it is i mean um cities are probably the most complex of all environments and and like you said the the push towards you know, smarter or um more connected cities the amount of noise that needs filtering in, in that sort of an environment is going up at a exponential rate so it's actually one of the things that we tell our users from day one is that they're not alone uh, whilst we might want to think that you know 15 years has been a long time and you know we, we might want to think that the the movie is a reality and minority reports just around the corner um reality is that simply being able to cut through all of that noise in order to accurately and consistently identify just just identifying the things that you really should be caring about that's a pretty big challenge all unto itself with all of this noise and all this data that's coming in and it's a challenge that pretty much every city i've worked with has faced from from day one yeah yeah um and on that sort of subject of reality you joined us for the panel discussion around connected places a couple of weeks ago and we had representatives from cheltenham and newcastle and you know different scales of organization different scales of places what, what were your sort of takeaways and thoughts around the conversation on that panel and what you hear from the leaders in those kind of places? What sort of struck you about that conversation? Uh, what, what struck me was how quick it went. Um, and I mean, there were some really great points that we managed to, to squeeze in, but it, it really did feel like it flew by. I think um, one of the highlights for me was definitely hearing uh, how, how the other panelists from the various cities had already been looking at how they could get more out of the systems that they already had. So whether it was about how to actually reach people when everyone was isolating or how to use existing systems with slight tweaks or new algorithms and things that I think Jenny was talking about to achieve new and better purposes. Um, the limitations that cities had last year and you know, still often have when it comes to budgets it meant that they accelerated their thinking about not needing to necessarily reinvent the wheel but looked at how certain technology selections that they'd made previously often you know made those selections with a consideration for future flexibility but very rarely actually acted on that after the initial project that those decisions could actually be validated mm. i think the yeah, the other insight was about the importance of breaking down those silos. So, I mean, we um, we spoke about it on the panel and we've been seeing it for many years before the pandemic that cities were investing in you know, really fantastic technology to solve you know, particular problems, you know, point solutions, um, but they would all typically be in isolation rather than used as part of a, a bigger, broader picture. And that really is at the crux of a connected city that, that was the whole point of the panel right so um whether it's the ability to expose capabilities more openly so that people can choose what website or apps they want to use themselves rather than having to use a different service for every different function or whether it's talking about the troves of big data that's sitting in databases up and down the country um it's all about uh, um how these things can be used for for more purpose than we're getting out of them today. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. And we heard that sort of data connectivity piece across multiple settings, not just in terms of the sense of place, but in terms of, sort of data, you know, whether it's NHS data, government data, social security data, how we can, you know, within the ethical constraints, use and create that interoperability between the public sector data sets to create these new insights that can deliver better results. And that's, that's an exciting space in which to sort of play, as it were. Um, and you used the word acceleration. I'd like to pick up on that because <clears throat> lots of people have, have talked about this acceleration in the public sector, whether that's specifically around digital transformation, whether that's <clears throat> other, other projects. 
Hmm. What are you what are you seeing in terms of the public sector organizations you work with? Do you pick up on that sense of we want to move at greater pace, we have we have the license to move at pace? And then does that play through into seeing a greater desire to explore and implement technologies in a way that maybe didn't exist pre-COVID? What's your sense of that? Um I think the desire was always there, is, is the honest answer. I mean, m most people in the public sector uh, long ago realized the benefits that uh, digital evolution would bring to their environments. Um, but the hurdles that, that came with that have traditionally been quite slow to get over. Um, so you know, it's one of the things that sound really boring, uh, it's sounding boring as I'm saying it, but uh, avoiding disruption in order for or in, in favor of incremental innovation, but accelerated incremental innovation, so that it actually is less about the immediate transformation and becomes more of an evolution. Um, that's kind of the reality that we all actually live in. And it might sound strange coming from a technology providers such as us, but um, you know, no shortage of people disrupting uh talking about disrupting the industry and you know transforming how we run our cities and that sort of thing but it was really great on the panel um to to hear them uh, everyone echoing the, the same sentiment that um actually it's the opposite that we want we, we need to be able to accelerate improvements but it's all about improving what we need the technology for not just about implementing new technology for the sake of technology so yeah. Um, that's what we enjoy working with our customers to do and uh, providing them with specific benefits that they're actually looking for with the minimum amount of disruption. Yeah, that's really interesting because I think it's acceleration, <clears throat> agile, these words get bandied around. To hear you sort of unpack that and explain what that means in terms of relationships, in terms of implementation pieces, that's really useful to hear how that actually plays out in reality. So I like that a lot. And I think one of one of the other areas that obviously was touched upon and is particularly relevant to, to what you're doing with Everbridge is around the security piece. Obviously, that's kind of you know key part of what yeah. you're doing. And I know you've stressed in the past the importance of treating security as a specific kind of business function within a public sector organization or any business, as opposed to just packing it into somewhere else. So explain a bit how that how that works and, and more importantly, why it matters and what the benefits are of treating that security piece as a discrete function. Yeah, you may have picked up on it already, Tim, but it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a bugbear of mine is the propensity for for people to just implement technology for the sake of innovation or for the sake of technology without really identifying what the desired outcome is, what's the, the problem that you're trying to solve, or the more importantly, what's the job that you're trying to get done? And, that, and that's the question that we always ask our, our potential customers from, from day one is, um, what what do you need to do better? What what do you what constitutes success for any type of technology to be implemented in your city? And it, it's less so the case, uh, I would say, in in the public sector where you know, budget scrutiny traditionally is a little bit higher, um, but it still happens. Um, I mean, over the last decade of working with all manner of security professionals, the uh, one thing that's been fairly constant is that the people involved when it comes to security, they're really good at but they're not necessarily quite so well versed in the ways of business um and the idea of keeping your people safe it's always been understood to be a fairly fundamental requirement no matter what type of an organization you are or as a city um but doing that's often been perceived as a cost rather than a business enabler um in you know, we've seen there's been a bit of a shift in the relationship between the public and those charged with protecting them uh, you might refer to it as a cultural contract or something like that i think we mentioned it on the podcast as well uh sorry on the, on, on the panel as well um and it's that, that there's a significant um business enablement opportunity for cities um those who can not only keep people safe but also make them feel safe and make them engaged with keeping their communities safe it's a fairly simple concept. I mean, not, not only will people who feel safe be more likely to venture back outside and contribute more to our society and economy, um, the broader perception of that place or, this, or the city is going to be raised. Um, and 
most people are naturally quite risk averse so building a community where that risk is not just factually lower but widely perceived as such yeah. it's going to naturally lead to increased investments and all manner of um, uh, benefits too so what what we're saying is that security leaders need to start thinking in those kinds of terms or at least be supported by people who can translate the hard work that's being put into keeping people safe into business terms that will get the necessary approvals from the budget holders not just as essential costs because we need this today yeah. but as economically sensible investments for the longer term yeah it's, it's that shift again isn't it from that from that iron ring of, of security through to something that's actually about welcoming people in about attracting people about them feeling this is a place i want to do business this is a place i want to be this is a place i want to visit and that's a that's that's a really interesting shift and a distinction which which i think people probably don't appreciate uh and and how that mind shifts mindset shift in terms of those security people needs to be about okay what am i adding yeah. as opposed to just constraining or protecting and, and that sort of thing so it's, it's great for you to unpack that stuff it's really useful um and i suppose the next logical step is then well how does that play out you know if we have this uh, approach which is more about you know the security piece enabling other activities enabling that business investment that you talked about um there's a trend to, to this sort of consolidation into security centers and these fusion centers as opposed to you know standalone pieces so how does that converge security piece sort of play out and what are the main implications for public sector organizations i think it's it's basically the same for the public sector as it is for the private sector i mean uh, pretty much again everyone realizes today that more and more of our infrastructure, our essential services, um, and much of our security, it, it relies on digital networks. Um, most of the sensitive citizen data that might have at one time been in, in a file room somewhere, it's most likely now sat in a database somewhere. Um, so digital and physical security are so closely intertwined now that anybody that's looking at them in isolation Frankly, they're, they're taking a huge risk and is likely to be leaving themselves exposed in one way or another. And as we become even more connected, it's very similar to when a, a city grows in physical size. Like the, the challenge of keeping everything secured, it gets exponentially harder. Um, but I mean, we would like to think that this shouldn't be putting us off. Uh, we should be looking at it as an opportunity unity the the capabilities that digitalization enables and the experience that we have from managing the safety of our citizens from from physical risks like these things can really help each other as long as we start thinking of both of them as part of the same function and that's what you know, these ideas of fusion centers are all about is ultimately it's a keeping people both digitally and physically secure yeah and the risk the risk question is an interesting one because i think there's a danger that in the public sector you, you sort of see risk as this big existential threat you know sort of calamitous uh you know sort of doomsday scenarios but of course risk isn't like that you know the scale so you know we've got the idea of micro risk and macro risk and i know that's something that, that you've spoken about before which is do do public sector organizations really understand and make that distinction and if they don't what, what are they missing in terms of the nuance that they should be picking up um well it's, it's very similar to the to the physical and digital um point of it, it really is about viewing keeping people safe as a holistic function uh, i think i i touched on it earlier but one of the um, really important trends that we've seen uh, is the relationships between what was previously perhaps lumped under a security banner and what was traditionally called something like public safety. Um, like they're, they're ultimately the same mission. You know, they're, they're keeping the cities and the environments that we live in and work in and the people in, they're keeping us safe. Um, in, the, in the private sector, it's a little bit more defined. It's a little bit easier to see those divisions. Like we, we tend to talk about it in terms of inside outside uh, rather than micro macro, um, but it's effectively the same thing. Um, and what I mean is that there's well, there, most organizations or cities have, will, will be familiar with it, that they might be have groups of analysts that are responsible for looking at all of the external risks like you know flooding 
terror threats, hurricanes, whatever it might be, the big bad things. Yeah. That, that, that's what we mean by the, the, by the macro risks. Uh, and they would normally be coming from outside the city. And then you would traditionally um, have had operators responsible for looking at all of the internal, the, the micro risks and events. So that's normally manning call centers, monitoring sensors, looking at banks of CCTV feeds, uh, that, that sort of thing. But they're both basically serving the same purpose. Um, why would we have them operating in complete isolation uh, instead of uh, actually sh openly sharing intelligence and capabilities with each other as long as they can do that, as you said earlier, in a controlled and secure way? Um, I mean, we've seen all too often that something that starts out as a micro risk, right, a small little thing, can escalate and become a, a major incident affecting the whole city or even broader. And that when we then look back and we see uh, perhaps we had the opportunity to have nipped that in the bud a little bit earlier if we'd have been sharing information better, if we'd have been speaking to each other or had technology helping us in, in, in some way there. And I, same goes the other way, right? It should be fairly obvious that when there's a, a major incident that actually happens, then the more real time data that you can get out of the people who are normally just looking at these little micro risks, whether that's, you know, real time video feeds, roughly how many people are in a location, what else is going on in the area, that sort of stuff. Uh, those can be fairly essential data points to help you manage those potential crises that come from those bigger things a lot better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there's a there's an element that you, you referenced earlier, and I think it came out with, with the conversation on the panel discussion from some of our um, sort of local government uh, leaders, which is around this idea of citizen engagement and, and how that can play into not, not just security, but also, you know, the sort of the connected nature of both technology, but also the community. Um, and the, the sort of COVID period has in some ways reignited some of those aspects, you know, whether everything from flapping on the doorstep through to people volunteering and sort of frontline services. There seems to be this sort of spark of community engagement that's maybe reignited. And potentially, we, you know, if we can, we can harness that. How, how does that impact through into the sort of security and sort of safety piece for you? Yeah, so, I mean, it's actually another trend which we saw starting in the private sector you know, before COVID. Um, and I think we, we, we talked about it a bit on the panel as well, like you said, but and I think everyone agrees and, and agreed there that an engaged community is um, likely more conducive towards a safer community and one where people feel empowered by the city that they live in because their voices are being heard and they're being communicated back to in a way that's actually meaningful to them. Um, and that, that's really important as well, you know, looping back to that, looking at things through a business lens. Um, it's really important that if you're expecting people to give their input and to contribute towards the city and the society that they're getting something back in return for it it's a two-way street um and I, I guess in in the private sector we saw organizations finding that um using tools that you know, got their employees more engaged with the safety and security of their workplace it was hugely successful with very little investment that's actually required from the organization themselves. I mean, there's not much by way of technology required. There is much more about that mind shift and the, the mentality of the organization. And the, the key, as you know, quite often is the case, well, certainly I find, is that it's about providing the, the simplest means possible for citizens to provide input and, you know, again, more importantly, to consume that information back um, from from the public sector that makes them feel heard and makes them or keeps them up to date and engaged with what's going on in the city. Um, yeah, it, was, it was one of the things that I also really enjoyed hearing on the podcast. I remember who said it now, but it, it was um, about inclusivity and it's, uh, I'll hold my hand up, it's all too easy nowadays for, uh, I class myself as a techie, I'm a nerd, um, but people like me you know, think that the easiest ways, uh, when we're talking about simplicity, well, that just means an easy to use app, right? Um, but you know, obviously that isn't, is, isn't the case, right? Um, and it, everything is relative and we need to make sure that we're catering to everyone to make sure that everyone in our societies can be kept engaged and able to get the same benefits from being an active participant in these types of initiatives. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, it's been it's been so interesting to hear how uh, technology, security, safety, 
play out in, in so many more ways than you might expect. We've moved on from the idea of it just being this sort of draconian protective layer over our places and, and this idea that it's now an enabler, it's now about drawing together different parts of the business and the economy. So it's been brilliant to talk through some of that. Really interesting to hear how it how it actually works in reality. So just want to say thanks so much for joining us, Daniel. It's been a, a fantastic conversation. Absolute pleasure, Tim. Thank you so much for having me again. It's our pleasure. Thanks again to Daniel for joining me for the conversation. So interesting to hear how technology has moved on from just being a security and CCTV piece to being an enabler that attracts investment and makes people feel like cities and towns are where they want to be, spend time, live, spend their leisure time. As I said, Daniel was part of the Connected Cities panel discussion at the recent GovX Digital Conference. It's a conversation well worth checking out to learn how the Connected Cities agenda is moving along, how some of the smart places like Cheltenham and Newcastle are playing out the connection piece to create better communities, stronger economies, and places where people want to live and work. The link to join that session and watch on demand at your leisure is in the show notes attached to this episode. So give it a click, sign up and watch and learn. That's about all from us for this episode, but join us again soon when we'll have another conversation with a public sector change maker. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>